Thank you so much, Chris and Tricia, for that beautiful song. It's already a sermon in itself. We can actually get out now and have potluck. <laughs> this week, uh, Bobby and Chris and I were chatting. They were asking me about the, my sermon today. And so I told him the title about the tempest in the Sea of Galilee. And when he sent me this video of his chosen song, I went on my knees and prayed and said, God, don't let me start my sermon by crying. It's a beautiful song. Today we will be talking about experiences in life. When the storms of life come to us, can we find peace in the midst of the storm? A farmer in Kansas had just gotten through a terrible storm. He had an insurance adjuster came to the house to survey the damage. The adjuster noticed that the roof of the farmer's barn had been lifted intact and placed on the ground 50 feet away. So the adjuster told the farmer, oh, I see you have lost the roof to your barn. And the farmer answered, no, sir, it is not lost. It just ain't where I want it to be. You see, when the storms of life come our way, we may not be where we want to be, or maybe where God wants us to be. But thanks to the saving grace of, of God, no storms can hinder us from praising him. Because when we have him, we should never be afraid of any storm. Growing up, my mother was a choir director, and my father was the lead singer. I never got their talent genes for singing. But we, the kids, we were always instructed to memorize every song that the choir will sing because we are part of the choir, although we don't have to come every Sabbath when they sing. And my mom was very strict in emphasizing words. Like when it's the storm, you have to say it loud, storm. And when it's peaceful, you have to say still, peace, be still. So one day, she wanted us to memorize the song, Master, the tempest is raging. So every night after evening worship, we have to memorize the song until we got so tired of it. And then on Friday evening during our worship, all five of us kids would have to stand, you know, in our, in our house. There's our parents' bedroom and our children's bedroom, and there's like a little stage with five steps going down to the living room. And that's where the five of us would be standing for our audition with my dad listening. And we would be singing the, the song for the Sabbath. That night, we did a rendition. And my mom was so pleased. Oh, you are ready to join the choir tomorrow. She was so pleased. We went to bed, and at midnight, there was chaos downstairs. I heard my dad talking. I heard him talking to my brother, Benny. My brother, Benny, is a sleepwalker. Sometimes he would get out during the night and walk through the streets. So I heard my dad said, Benny, wake up. And there was my brother by the door. He was standing and he was singing, Master, the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high. And my dad said, come on, it's no longer practice time. It's time to go to bed. The winds and the waves shall obey my will. He started singing the whole piece until he really finished it. You know, and then my, he finally woke up and he said, oh, see you tomorrow. <laughs> That's why this song is very special to me because as a child, I knew it by heart. And I can still memorize it. And I can still imagine my mom's face when she tells us you know, how to really emphasize the words. This hymn was actually composed by Dr. Horatio Palmer. And its lyrics was written by Marianne Baker. Marianne Baker was 42 years old when her only brother died from tuberculosis, a sickness which also killed 
her mom and her dad a few years back. He, she loved her brother so much, so she was so sad. And you know, she was very active in the church. She thought she was a really good Christian. In fact, she was in charge of an organization that about uh, stopping tobacco use, you know, to be, and all these many organizations in church, she was so active. And when her brother died, she went into despair. And she said, how could a, the, the God whom I served all my life cause this to happen? My parents died and now my only brother died. She was so sad. But then her coworker, Dr. Horatio Palmer, called her one day to add lyrics to the song, that, to, to, what, to his composition. And that was the song that I just sang earlier. Master, the tempest is raging. And when she, she, did, she did that, you know, she, she added the lyrics and she said, these are her words, my brother died. I became wickedly rebellious at this dispensation of divine providence. I said in my heart that God did not care for me or mine. But the master's voice in the song stilled the tempest in my unsanctified heart and brought it to the calm of a deeper faith and a more perfect trust. Have you ever been in the, in the storm of life? Of course, the lyrics of the song came from Mark 4, 35 and 41. Imagine that you are in the Sea of Galilee today. The Sea of Galilee is actually a vast lake in northern Israel. I wonder if any one of you have been to the Sea of Galilee. It is nearly 700 feet below sea level. It is more than, it is nearly eight miles at its widest point and 12 miles long from north to south. The sea plunges down deep into depths of 200 feet below. But around the Sea of Galilee are beautiful hills. The hills of Galilee reach 14,000 feet, 1,400 feet above. And on the other side is the Golan Heights, which is 2,500 feet. And it is because of these, these hills that added beauty to this place. It turns green in the spring, brown during the dry season, contrasting the deep blue sea. This location is actually subject to storms because of its, of its location. With the northeast winds blow cool air to the warm sea, that produces storms. And it has been scientifically proven that that could happen. But I wonder sometimes, because it is unusual for Jesus to really go out in the sea in a boat. I wonder if Jesus did it intentionally for a lesson for the disciples and for us. Let me read Mark 4, 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed as well. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and began to fill the water and began to fill it with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke up saying, Master, don't you care that we are going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked, why are you afraid? Do you have no faith? Of course, the disciples were terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. You see, the disciples thought they were perishing. They were fishermen, you know. They should know the conditions of the day, although they had no weather channel then. But I guess they trusted their expertise and wisdom rather than recognizing that Jesus was with them. But when Jesus spoke, the disciples saw the real truth of the situation. There was absolute calm. 
because Jesus was with them. Has any one of you been in a storm lately? The storms of life can come and go in our lives. How are you coping? How discouraged are you? You see, even the storms can teach us lessons. Let's go to lesson number one. Storms teach us to be grateful. Do you really think you can be grateful when you're in the middle of the storm? One of my favorite characters in the Bible is the Apostle Paul. Paul has lived a very dramatic life and had encountered so many storms, stormy episodes in his ministry. You know, he was imprisoned many times. The Bible recorded, records three huge prison time with Paul, but I wonder, since he was, has been in the ministry for 35 years, he probably have had more stormy episodes than the three that were recorded. Paul was imprisoned many times, but in Acts 9, but you see, God had chosen Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Acts 9, 15, 16 says, but the Lord said, go, soul is my chosen instrument to take my messages to the Gentiles and to the kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Can you imagine? This was his ministry, but God already knew that he will have to suffer with his ministry. And that was not just being in prison. It included beatings, shipwreck, stonings, several arrests. You know, his first recorded arrest was in Macedonia. Remember the story when there was a demon-possessed young girl who was screaming and yelling. You know, he was, she was actually earning a lot of money because she was supposedly telling, oh, she was a fortune teller, but she was demon-possessed. So she was earning a lot of money because people come to her to, you know, for their fortune. But the girl was so annoying and disruptive. And so finally, Paul turned around, and what did he do? He commanded the demon to leave her. So the demon left, but the girl's owners were so angry. Because why? Now they're not going to earn money. They were upset. You know, so what did they do? They reported Paul and Silas, and they had to go to prison for nothing. They did not commit any sin, but they had to go to prison. But what happened when they were in jail? Do you remember the story? The earthquake came. That's right. A huge earthquake came, and Paul's and Silas' chains came loose, and the prison doors opened. And the jailer thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in trouble. You know, because, you know, he was in charge of the prisoners. But then, what did Paul say? We are right here. We didn't escape, we are still here. The jailer was so happy that he took them home, tended their wounds, and guess what happened? Everyone in his household were baptized. Paul was in a stormy point of his life, but he still did the, the best thing he loves to doing, and that is to proclaim Christ. He was still grateful in spite of the challenges that he had. And then his next imprisonment came when the, he was supposed to be doing something against the Jews, and they added another two years of his imprisonment. But the good thing is he was allowed to live with family who could provide him food. He was allowed to live in a home and to receive provisions. And once again, he did what he loved to do best, proclaiming the gospel of Christ. And it was during his imprisonment that, as you know, he wrote some of the 13 books that he had written. Something good came out of it. Tumultuous and stormy weather in life there's still so much to be thankful for. In fact, when he was in prison, he wrote, 
He learned the secret of being content. In Philippians 4, 11, 13, he says, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content in whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything with this Christ who gives me strength. And at the very end, before he was martyred, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on this day. To the very end, he was still grateful. Are you going to be grateful when the storms of life come to you? Lesson number two. Storms can teach us real joy. Perhaps you know the story of Corrie ten Boom. You know, the family helped the Jews, you know, escape from the Nazis' hands. Can you imagine being in prison in concentration camp? All of Corrie ten Boom's family were there. And because of their during the, the years that they were, in two years, they have helped 600 Jews escape, you know, from imprisonment. Their home was called the hiding place. But then a neighbor reported them to the Nazi police, so they came and inspected their home. They found nothing, but they were still suspicious, so they sent them to the faraway camp, where they suffered starvation, all kinds of diseases, and Cory Ten Boom's dad died 10 days later. A year later, her very own sister, Betsy, died. But before she died, Betsy said, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Prison life was devastating, but the miraculously, Cory was let go. And she said, God does not have problems, only plans. And for the rest of her life, until she died at the age of 96, she was still serving the people, helping the people who were in need during the war because she found joy amidst the storm. Lesson number three, Trash storms teach us real treasure. Do you remember when Typhoon Yolanda or Haiyan came that was 2013. I cannot forget that because that was also the day that my mom died. When I got the letter that she died in our very Adventist hospital, I had to make arrangements to fly. So I immediately got my flight, which was supposed to stop to Narita, Japan before Manila. When I arrived in Narita airport, they said this, Typhoon Yolanda has hit the Philippines and there was no other flight. So I was on standby in Narita, Japan for several hours until they finally said, you know, we can arrange for you to be transferred to another flight. This will go to Hong Kong this time. So I took the plane from Narita to Hong Kong. When I arrived in Hong Kong, they said my flight was supposed to go straight to Cebu where my mom was. And they said, sorry, but the storm is in Cebu. There was no flight, so I had to wait for hours. So the usual flight to go to the Philippines is usually 23 to 24 hours, depending on the stopovers. Guess what? It took me almost 60 hours before I reached home. And you know what happened in the Philippines? It was the worst storm that has ever come to that country. 6,300 people died. That's only the recorded ones. There were others that were not. It was devastating. A lot of homes you know, were de totally destroyed. People were homeless. It was considered as the deadliest Philippine typhoon. I have a friend who was a millionaire who had just finished building their dream home, beautiful, beautiful home, completely gone. And she said, that's not where my treasure is. 
I know someday I will have my home up there. Life is more precious than any earthly treasures that you have. Even Apostle Paul said, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surprising greatness of knowing Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Storm can indeed teach us what is more precious and where our treasures are. Lesson number four, storms teach us real strength. You know, I am not a really patient person. I get easily irritated with small annoyances and problems. But when my husband was diagnosed in February with acute myeloid leukemia, I was in total despair. As a nurse, I knew what the outcome would be. I knew what could happen. I was devastated. I am very thankful to all of you who prayed for me and my family. And I usually love it when I come to church, which was very rare in those months, when they said, oh, really, now we've been praying for you. How's your husband? I especially love our head elder, Dave, my cousin, because he will always say, how's Helmut? And then after I gave him all the, what has happened that, the, that week, what has transpired, he would always say, how are you? Really, you, you know? He really wants to know how I was feeling. And that was really huge, Dave, because I was really in the worst storm of my life. Because I have to handle everything. My husband will just say, when the doctors come, he will just say, oh, tell that to your wife, not to me. I know nothing about medicine. You know, my nurses come and tell him, and he will turn to me and say, am I supposed to do that, honey? You know, he relied every, everything to me. So I was like, oh my gosh, you know, if I, did not, if I did not have God with me, if I didn't spend all my waking hours in prayer, I wouldn't be here today. It was the worst storm in my life. I had to make all the decisions. I have to replace my fears with my deep faith in God to give us both the strength that we need. But the most amazing thing is, that was the end of February, and now it's July, and my husband is now in remission. Amen. Thank God for all your prayers. Second Corinthians 12, nine says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weaknesses. God will give us the strength that we need in any storms. Have you watched the, the series Man vs. Wild? It's in Discovery Channel. I don't know if you've known the guy. I never really knew him until I got to read his book. But Bear Grylls is one of the most recognized faces of survival and adventure. You know, he spent, as a young boy, he was into martial arts. So when he grew up, he became a soldier in the British Special Forces, where he learned survival skills. But then he had a freak accident where he fell down while he was in Africa, and he broke his back in three places. That was devastating for someone who was so active and, you know, who was into sports. He was in and out of so many military rehabs. He was desperate, he was in despair. But then he recovered. And guess what, at the age of 23 years old, 23 years of age, he went to climb Mount Everest in spite of his bad, bad back with, with some of his friends. And they encountered, if you read the book, you, you will have fun reading, all the many storms that they have encountered. In fact, four of those in his team died because of the icy storms. But Bear Grill survived. And then, a few years later, married this time with a pregnant wife, he decided with four of his friends 
to cross the, the Atlantic Northwest. They wanted to cross the Atlantic Northwest in this open inflatable boat. Can you imagine that? First, it was just to make a record, you know, an attempt to complete the first unassisted crossing of the frozen North Atlantic. But then it became the most terrifying battle against storm-forced winds, giant crashing waves, and icebergs as big as cathedrals. It was the most, it was the, recorded as the most amazing, you know, in, dangerous adventure ever done in the Labrador Sea. They suffered from hypothermia because they have nothing to cover them, to shield them. But they all made it. And not only that, he has also been to the quicksand storm in Utah. He has always believed that he has to do whatever he, he needs to survive. But you know, in his own words, he said, storm make us stronger. I hold on to that if I am going through a hard time, I know it's, going to be for, it's not going to be forever. And how I act in the storm defines me. I don't run away from these difficult moments. They are opportunities. I always start today on my knees. I just get down on my, the floor next to my bed. My grandpa used to do that while I was growing up and I loved it until this day. It is a way to remind me to be grateful, to say sorry, and to ask for help when I need it. It is my only way to survive the day, wherever I am. A strong man still believes on going down on his knees when he goes to any adventure knowing that their storms will be there. In his most recent interview in Fox News, he said, the most important part of my life is my faith in Jesus Christ. My Christian faith is the backbone of my life. You cannot keep God out. He is all around us. If we are just still enough to listen. Sometimes we do need that in our lives. We live in a chaotic world and we just need time to find peace and silence so we can hear God's God's word and what he wants for us. I'm sure most of us have had storms in our lives as individuals, as communities, even as a church. And sometimes we ask, Master, care is thou not that we perish. But in the other hand, we will hear his voice saying, why should you be afraid? Don't you have any faith? And I hope that when the storms of life come to you, God will remind you. He will say, I can handle the situation for you, for your best interest, and you will know more of me because of this. That's how I always look at it, when I am in a situation where I feel that I am alone. Because you know, oftentimes we're like the disciples, crying, help me, Lord, help me, I'm perishing. Or we say, if you really cared, why did you allow this to happen? Surely you can perform a miracle. What is taking you so long? You know, that's our human tendency to ask. So we pray for healing and relief, for opportunity, for anything that will make the violent storm stop. But the thing is, in this story of the raging storm in the Sea of Galilee, Thank you, Gina, for the illustration. The point is not the storm. It is who is in the boat with you during the storm. Jesus was in the boat with them. Did they forget that? They need not fear. Sometimes God use, sees the storm as a means to test us and to help us get, get closer to him so that we will call on him, because sometimes we forget to do that. God uses the dark, scary, uncertain times of life as an opportunity for him to demonstrate his power, not ours. 
and for God to get the glory, not us. So he uses trials and stormy moments to get us closer to him. Are you experiencing a storm in your life right now? Will you still be grateful for what you have? Can you find joy in the midst of the storm and find strength and deep faith in God? My prayer is that we see God's amazing, powerful intervention during the stormy times of your life, and may we find that peace amidst the storm. To close, I would like you to watch this video and the song. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for being with us in the boat in the storms of life. May we always have you in our, beside us, and may we find peace in the midst of the storm. Dismiss us now with your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.